Hello, Louise, and um, welcome to this, this, this interview. Firstly, congratulations on being uh, shortlisted for the Alice Davis Hitchcock medallion. I imagine that's very exciting for you, and I think we've got a great list of uh, shortlistees this year. I'm interviewing all of them and trying to draw out from the, the speakers, the writers, I should say, some of the, um, I don't know, hidden facts about the books. So maybe first of all, you'd like to introduce yourself. Well, I taught history of art and architecture at Warwick University for many years, but since 2014, I've been working as an independent scholar and curator. And it's given me time, amongst other things, to write this book. Well, your book is called Studio Lives, Architect, Art and Artist in the 20th, in, in 20th Century Britain. And um, how did you come onto this topic and what was it that interested you about it? Well, I came to it really through the 19th century. I'd always enjoyed looking at Victorian artists' houses in London's Holland Park, particularly houses like Lord Leighton's and the Norman Shaw houses around it. And I speculated about the dialogue which must have occurred between the architects who designed them and the artists who used them. And I began to wonder what happened after the golden age of, Victorian, of the Victorian artist. How and where did their 20th century successors live in London and elsewhere? I think that um, there's a really interesting turning point around the turn of the century. You mentioned uh, Richard Norman Shaw. And of course, he wrote a book with Thomas Graham Jackson uh, questioning whether architecture was a profession or an art. And he was very much on the side of it being an art. Now, in, your, in the synopsis for your book, you suggest that university level training for architects introduced in Britain after 1900 distanced architects from the needs and tastes of their clients. And you ask if this was the case, um, were artists exceptions to the rule? Would you like to expand on that? Well, artists do have very particular needs regarding space and light. And that suggests a degree of very serious involvement in the design process. Um, the status which university level training gives to architects after 1900 tends to overawe some of their clients at least. But I think our artists are the exception. They tended to be less passive and they do often make quite significant interventions in the design process. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the sculptor Effie McWilliam, who very much co-designed the house in New Malden, which he had asked a fellow student, Horace Townsend, who was studying architecture at the Bartlett while McWilliam was studying at the Slade, and they are very much co-designers. So I think that's a, a sort of particularly clear example of an artist not being <laughs> overawed by the expertise of the architect, but really jumping into the driving seat or co-seat. Well, um, whether or not architecture should be taught at universities is a, a large topic for discussion elsewhere, and I've got uh, particular views on that. But, um, you know, you say the, the change came around 1900, and my own school of architecture, the University of Liverpool School of Architecture, was in fact the first um, university level program in architecture in the modern era, that is to, to, um, to educate architects. But we, we won't dwell on that. Let's, uh, let's move forward. Your book considers architects, their professional formation and their relations with, art, with artists. Now, um, to what extent were these 
artists formative, not only for the design of their own studios, but also for the development of the architects with whom they worked. Can you, you've given us one example, but can you give us some more examples? Did the, did the artists redirect the architects and their intentions? Well, it's a very interesting question. And when I was looking at the painter Gluck, um, who built a little studio behind her house in Hampstead, uh, the architect was Edward Morph. I think there was a very particular influence um, on Morph's work uh, then and subsequently. Gluck produced exquisite, finely detailed flower paintings. That was her speciality in the 30s when Morph built her this studio. And the crispness of the detailing of the garden studio and a particular feature of a delightful concrete lily pad fountain between the house and the studio are I think a homage by Morph to Gluck's work and it does feed into Morph's subsequent very refined paired back neo-Georgian domestic buildings so for example, Precious Field of 1934, which comes after the, the Gluck design. Uh, another example uh, is Leslie Martin and Sadie Spade, whose very first buildings are sort of crisp, modernist, cubic buildings. But when they work for Alistair Morton up in Cumberland in the late 1930s, they respond to his immersion as a painter and designer in the landscape. Uh, they begin to introduce texture, uh, local, some local materials and colour and created a house which embraced the view. Um, the house is called Brackenfell and Brackenfell contained a great deal of modern art collected by Morton as well as art he'd made himself. And it does have a legacy in Martin's work, uh, for example, in his design for enlarging Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, where the domestic setting is absolutely key to the perception of the art displayed there. I think Kettle's Yard is a really interesting example, and I, I can think of a number of architects' offices that are not that dissimilar to Kettle's Yard and the, um, the quality of the spaces which, uh, which are converted or used as architectural design spaces. And the, the, the difference in many ways between an artist's studio and an architect's office must be at times um, very little. In your book, you argue that artists were singular clients, sure of their own tastes and specific in their requirements. Their commissions, you say, conform to an older tradition in which architects saw themselves as providing a service to their clients rather than using commissions as an opportunity to experiment. It would seem, however, that this might pertain only to Britain, the subject of your book, of course, for I can think of Le Corbusier's uh, Ozenfant studio of 1922 in Paris, which was very much an experiment. Can you comment on these? Um, on this difference? Well, the artist client has a formative role outside Britain as well as inside. Um, Ozenfant's house is very interesting, uh, but it's interesting and important for Ozenfant as well as for Corbusier. I think very articulate, very original, very determined architects like Corbusier make us forget their clients and their, the users of their buildings. Ozenfant was the son of a building contractor specialising in concrete and he studied architecture before he studied painting. He teaches Corbusier to paint in oils and they collaborate very closely on the journal L'Esprit Nouveau. They also collaborate on this house where Ozenfall claimed that he produced the plan. 
and that Corbusier did the artistry, as he put it. So their, their roles are rather interestingly blurred in the 20s, and the house is a sort of manifestation, or sorry, a manifesto for a new kind of machine age art, as well as for a new architecture. And Corbusier is not the only architect to work with clients in France at this time. Auguste Perret is also very significant. He built six artist studio houses, each of which were subtly differentiated according to the needs of their occupants. They're highly expressive of their art. Uh, he used texture, pattern and colour to convey the character of the work made there, as well as to the demands of, the, of the, those who commissioned them. Well, I think um, those of us who uh, follow Le Corbusier are probably not surprised that um, he puts it across that maybe nobody else is really involved in it. I'm to hear of Ozenfant's um, importance in this particular project. In taking the stories you do beyond the First World War, you note that along with female emancipation, women assumed an increasingly important place in the art world. Was uh, women's approach to art at this time different to that of men? And, and how, did, how did the studios built for them differ from their male counterpart studios? Well, that's an interesting question. I think it's not so much a matter of women approaching art differently from men as inventing particular strategies for getting recognized. So Eileen Egar, uh, whose studio apartment was designed by Rodney Thomas in the 30s, Agar uses this studio rather like a sort of, she turns it into a three-dimensional collage, juxtaposing images and overlaying the clean modernist interior which Thomas had made for her. It's absolutely instrumental in her being identified as a surrealist. She receives her but read there who says, yes, you must be in the surrealist exhibition. Uh, journalists come and say, oh, a bright young thing is now a surrealist artist. So for her, it was very important. Um, Dora Gordine, who had been a client of Perret, builds her own house in Kingston, uh, dismisses a series of architects and works with a builder. And she builds not only two marvellous studios to work in, but a gallery in which to display her art. And it serves as a sort of bastion, if you like, of figurative art, triumphs the importance of figurative sculpture in an era when people like Nam Gabo were departing from an old approach to sculpture and old materials of sculpture. Um, and of course the exterior, this rather fortress-like Byzantine looking brick building, is an expression of, of Gordine's interest in uh, the long history of Russian architecture too. So that, if you like, is her way of positioning herself in the British art world. If I remember the, the interior of the Ozefont studio correctly, the, um, the model's changing room is at high level in this double height space. It's, it's raised uh, um, up one story, as it were, in the double height space. And there's a stairs descending from that. And this strikes me as a nicely um, male fantasy that the, the model presumably disrobes in the um, changing room at high level and then has to descend the stairs, an object of fascination, uh, before any serious work is done with the paintbrush. And I, I can't imagine this being um, the, the situation in any uh, women's studio. No. Well, that's interesting because, in fact, when Ozenfant's studio was built, he wasn't uh, painting the figure. He and Corbusier, as you know, were working on purism, so oh. arrangement of still lives 
involving bottles and dishes and musical instruments and so on. Yeah. His interest in figuration comes a bit later. But fair point, yes. In your uh, submission for the um, Alice Davis Hitchcock medallion, you note that architectural historians have become increasingly interested in the user's experience of architecture. Why do you think this is and how, how is this reflected in your own book? Well, I think it was in the 1970s that Lubetkin said uh, that the real life of a building begins once it leaves the architect's drawing board and the building site and the user takes command. And I think we've become interested in the user's experience of architecture in the course of reassessing the legacy of modernist architecture. Um, it emerged strongly in the community architecture movement of the 70s. Projects like Ralph Erskine's Bike a Wall. More recently, it's been enhanced by studies of hospital architecture, school architecture, and very recently, library design. There's also now an interest in neuroscience and environmental psychology. So I think all of these are enhancing, if you like, um, a tendency to look at architecture differently from a different perspective. And my book tried to consider the emotional and aesthetic, as well as the practical and professional functions of studio building. Um, studios very much frame and articulate the lives and occupations of those who use them. Well, architecture um, is very cyclical, I think. And when I was studying 50 years ago, half a century ago, we seemed to be rather interested in, um, in the user. And then my impression is that all rather went out of the window. No longer do we teach our students architectural psychology which seems to me to be an important topic. But, you know, I, I hope all this, as you're indicating, um, comes back into focus. So, um, what is your next book going to be about, now that you're an independent scholar and you must have lots of time on your hands? <laughs> well, uh, my next book, uh, which will accompany an exhibition in 2021, looks at art and design in the Midlands, in the post-war years. Um, it departs from previous work I've done on Basil Spence. It looks at all the other things that were happening in and around Coventry in the 50s and 60s, when Coventry was a test bed for experiments in planning, school building, housing, public art, and of course was a place where there were high levels of consumption. People were very interested in buying new things for their homes. It's going to be called Mercian Modernism and amongst other things it will identify Coventry not as we're being led to believe a city of culture but as a city of public sculpture. Well um, as you know the society went to uh, Coventry uh, just over a year ago for the for the um, autumn study tour and we saw much of the, the work which you are discussing so I think that would be really interesting and I look forward to that. Well Louise, um, I have no idea who's going to win this medallion but I wish you every, every luck with this. Um, it's a fascinating book and I'm sure you have a very very good chance. So thank you so much for joining me in this brief discussion and we look forward to um, your next project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil.